You are about to enter the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast on ShockwaveSkullSessions.com. And now your host, Bob Nalbandian. All right, welcome to another sh- episode here of the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast. I'm co-host and producer Matt Hartnett. And here joining us today on this episode, we have, of course, our main man, the host himself, Bob Nalbandian, checking in with us from Lake Elsinore down in Southern California. Bob, how's it going? Dude, you got the total radio voice going. I love it, Matt. I don't know if you want to call me the main man now after that interview you did, uh, the uh, podcast you did with uh, Amphetamine Reptile. Nah, like, man, Bob. You're st- the new main man nah. of the soul session. Now nah, there's only one main man. Only one main man. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I, I might be demoted after this. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I'm down south at Lake Elsinore, taking a little a vacation and uh, visiting my buddy uh, Spickle, who everybody knows. What's up, Spickle? Uh, just hanging out here at the lake with the Harry now bandy. That is correct. <laughs> we, uh, you know, Spickle did a previous a previous episode with uh, Neely and I, uh, which was a lot of fun. And uh, so I'm down at his place. I'm going to spend about a week in Los Angeles. So. Uh, Figured while I was down here, we'll we'll uh, whip out this other episode and our other Mike from or what part of Oregon are you from, Fongster? Washington. I'm in the Seattle area, so I'm across the. Yeah, water. I don't even know the difference between Washington and Oregon. Why? Why am I thinking you're in Oregon? <laughs> because you don't pay attention to anything that I do. We actually have. I, I don't know if you realize, but we actually haven't spoken in in probably five or six years. I can. I can tell you the last time that I remember talking to you on the phone, which is actually a, a, a funny thing, but I don't think we've actually yeah. spoken in a long time. So well, yeah, I know I'm we out, uh, in, that's very different from speaking to each other. Cause I hadn't even spoken to you last time you had your, your medical issues. So the last time I remember speaking to you, I don't know if you remember this, this is probably around 2013 or so, because I was in LA wow. with my, my wife, we weren't married yet. And you and I were supposed to hook up, but we ended up getting to L.A. really late. And you were also interviewing a band really late that night. And you went, you went even later. Um, but I remember the band that you were interviewing. You were interviewing the band Lion. Do you remember what, what band? Lion. Oh, Lion. It was probably Jerry yeah. Best when he was with Manny Charlton from Nazareth. Was that it? Yeah, I, I don't know. But the funny thing was... Lion split up in the 80s and they... Um, but right. it was probably it was probably Jerry Best from Lion, Pro- probably. But th- you had mentioned Lion, and the thing was that I was born I was born in 1980, and I grew up watching Transformers, the cartoon Transformers, my absolute favorite toy. And I know Lion because they did the theme song to the Transformers movie. The Transformers That's soundtrack right. was my very first tape. That was my very first cassette. That was my own, and so Lion was a big part of my childhood. I didn't know anybody else in the world who knew that band Lion. <laughs> You're the first person wow. who I was well, going to Lion speak was about Doug that Aldridge, band. as you know, Doug. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Doug yeah. Aldridge, uh, just a little history. Lion was one of the most uh, underrated L.A. bands of the 80s. They had one record on Scotty Brothers, and then I think they did a live record after on Grand Slam or something like that. But the uh, Scotty Brothers album, the it was... Uh, Doug Aldrich on guitar, who's played with everybody, you know, Dio, right. White Snake. Uh, he's in like 20 different bands. And Cal Swan, who is uh, in the great new wave of British heavy metal on Titan, and a fantastic drummer, Mark Edwards, who played on the Steeler album with Ingve Malmsteen. And I still talk to Mark. He's doing really well. Uh, he lives out in uh, uh, Texas. So, uh, yeah, the band split up years ago, but they're all. Nice Still pretty active. Daisies. Yeah, Dead Daisies. That's, uh, I guess... Uh, With what's-his-face from uh, Motley Crue. No, John Karabi, just, he just left Dead Daisies, what? and Glenn Hughes is singing with him now, supposedly. Oh, wow. With, uh... <laughs> oh, Glenn well, geez, well, where, 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 where were you in 86 when I was six years old? We could have sat together and talked about lying for hours. <laughs> <laughs> His well, I did know you when you were 18 years old. I guess people are wondering, who the fuck is Fong Duck Dong? <laughs> well, let me give you a story. Fong Duck Dong, this was, what, 1998, I believe, we started the Black I Lodge. Just started it. I just started at USC. It was 99, yeah. 99, okay, that's right. It was uh, myself, Toby, Toby Bod, who was my old partner in crime from the Skull Sessions, who 
No one, no one in the uh, podcast world has heard from him in quite some time. He's kind of disappeared from the podcast world. But uh, me, Toby, and uh, John Bush, who was in Anthrax at the time uh, in 99. And uh, we had a club called the Black Lodge, which was in Hollywood. It was every Wednesday night. It was actually held at the old uh, uh, club lingerie on Sunset, right across from the Canton Fiddle. And we would be getting emails. Were they emails then, or were they, were they letters back then? Back then, it was it was letters because I had just started at USC. I was a music industry major, and I was coming from a podunk town where there was nothing available. And I must have I grabbed one of those music industry magazines that had names and addresses uh, of uh, management music. companies, studios. And, uh, yeah, music industry. And I must have sent out about 60 or so resumes just to, to, to places in Los Angeles just trying to get an internship for the summer because I didn't want to go home during the summer. I wanted to stay. And uh, I saw somewhere, I don't remember where, maybe it was on hard radio, probably on hardradio.com, that you were starting uh, a, a metal night at a, at a club in L.A. called Black Lodge with John. And uh, I sent you a letter, and you called me back. And I built your website, and uh, we just stayed friends. And I got to meet uh, John Bush through you. And John is just like I got I've had the chance to to meet him a few times and interview him several times. It's just you interviewed him. It was Hard Radio podcast or the with the Shockwaves Hard Radio website, I believe, on hardradio.com. I, I did. I've got. Oh, I, I should have those micro cassettes somewhere. I should share them with you. There, there's some there's some pretty funny moments where I'm asking him to share like some. Like the most embarrassing music that he really liked, and there was one like techno song that he really liked, and I told him I didn't know, it, and he started singing it. So I'll see if I can find that clip and and send it to you. <laughs> but um, yeah, you awesome. know, I had no idea about your background, Bob. It wasn't until I went to one of your one of your uh, parties at, at at your apartment, and uh, I I mean I grew up a huge Megadeth fan, and uh, I just remember going to your apartment and going into your living room, and your living room walls were bare except for a gold record from rust in peace and i'm like what the I'm like what the hell is that how did you get that and you you told me about your history with marty friedman and how you uh were uh, you know you you helped get him into the band and i thought that that was a cool thing and i i actually met marty at um i had met marty at, at vip you know sessions at uh through uh at, at megadeth show because i had a, my buddy at the time ran megadeth.com but i saw marty play a show like in honor of jason becker in san francisco it was on new year's day and he played at this church. He played one of Jason's songs at this church, and it was awesome. Right. And uh, and my in to, to he was very approachable, but but my in to, to to talking to him was walking up to him and saying, "Hey, I'm friends with Bob," and he was and that was like an automatic in. You talk to anybody, any movie star, any rock star. You just say you're in with me. <laughs> It'll get you the red part of the treatment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, over over the years, I've called you as I've come across different things, and uh, you've always been kind of the the person who could could tell me exactly what happened. Like, I'll, I don't know if you remember this, but I had a uh, when I was when I was taking music industry classes, I had uh, a panel that I visited, and it had like four like heavy hitting dudes. Like one of them was like the manager for green day. And then I don't remember who the other two guys were, but there was a oh, Ron fourth guy. And I called right? Ron the feet. Yeah. I called you because I saw his name. I'm like, God, where have I heard that name? And then he talked about how he kind of started in music, you know, with armored Saint, And he talked about armored Saint and said, you know, back in the day, Motley Crue wanted to be armored Saint. Everybody wanted to be armored Saint. And he talked about his time with Megadeth and, and that sort of thing. And then, uh, I spoke with him afterwards, and it wasn't such a wasn't such a fun conversation. He's he's doing really well, but wasn't a fun conversation. And I remember calling you after that and and, uh, and talking to you about it. Yeah, have he's you, a big. Have you been following Ron at all? We we kept in touch. Uh, we were going to do something in uh, Korea, actually, with Pharrell. Believe it or not, he's. Ma- I don't know if he's still managing Pharrell, but you know my buddy Tommy, and who do, who's one of the biggest promoters in Korea. We were going to do that. So we met in his office and, you know, we talked about the old days and it was, it was great. It was like he, you know, we just talked for hours about that. And uh, so we, you know, we were in touch for a little while and, uh, you know, he's doing his thing and he's doing great. He kind of got out of the whole metal market. And we met again at the Metallica when Metallica did the uh, uh, record store day. They did uh, that big uh, after party, well, actually small after party, only like 50 of their closest friends and 
Uh, I was fortunately wow. invited at their old house in El Cerrito, and uh, we all hung out there, and Ron was there as well. We we always had real pleasant, you know, conversations every time I've seen him and run into him. But, you know, he's a busy guy. He's, he's on a much bigger level. He handles Alicia Keys, and uh, he was yeah. handling the sound part, and then uh, Chris Cornell, you know, when – uh, when he had passed, and uh, he, he put together that whole uh, uh, big tribute for Cornell at the Forum. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's a busy guy. But, yeah, he started out as Armored Saint. Actually, before Armored Saint, he started out as a writer for the Headbanger fanzine. Thank you very much. I got <laughs> where it all began. <laughs> Him and Gene Hoagland and many others started with me. Fantastic. <laughs> and by, old, by old little fanzines. Uh, but I got to tell you that I, I totally remember Eric Fong because he wrote this cool letter. Like, you know, we just started this rock club and it was basically just a social thing. None of us knew what the fuck we were doing. You know, John, myself and Toby, we never promoted clubs before. It was 90, you know, we, we talked about, it, I think, in 98. We finally did it in 99. We hooked up with lingerie. There was no metal anywhere, as you can attest. Uh, to, during that time, Eric, there were no metal clubs. Yeah. And we said, you know, we need a metal club. Let's get a social place where we could just crank up metal, drink beer, have all our old you know, friends just hang out and just party. And uh, that's all it was in those days. And we kept we got this letter from you. And I remember sharing it with uh, John and Toby and our opening night said you were a student. You were only 18. And, of course, the clubs then were all 21 and over, so we had to sneak you in. <laughs> we snuck you yeah. in the back, I think, <laughs> um, I think on several several of the nights. But, yeah, that was awesome. And then you started your uh, website, My Ass is on Fire. <laughs> That's right. That was, my, that was that? my college radio show. Yeah, that was my college <laughs> oh, that radio, show, radio and that show. was Yeah, after the Mr. Bungle song. And, and yeah, it was, uh, I was the metal director at KSCR, which was USC's radio station around like from like 2000 to 2001 or so. And uh, I had a ton of fun, you know, being in touch with everything that was going on in metal and connecting with college radio folks. I actually met my wife at, at the CMJ convention in New York in like 2000. So that was all a part of, you know, what, what helped me get to where I am here with, with oh, her. And, okay. and what was so, the name so, of the yeah, show? Like, yeah. My ass is on fire Sorry. after the Mr. Bungle song. Sounds like you had a one night stand with the Nalbandian. <laughs> 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 no, you were, you were leading up to something there, Spickle. <laughs> so speaking of Mr. Bungle, yeah. I know that's something you got on discuss. Uh, Matt, I'll turn it over to you. Cause I know you and, uh, Fongster were talking about Mr. Bungle, sure. that they're reuniting with, uh, uh, Lombardo on Dave Lombardo on drums, Scott Ian on rhythm guitar, and uh, uh, who who else is playing? Uh, well, they've got obviously Mike Pat. Sure, Mike Pat and the original uh, guitarist uh, Trace Bruins, who's a great guitarist in his own right, and then I believe Trevor Dunn, who I believe is the bassist. So three of the original members uh, are going to be uh, playing in that uh, reunion, and yeah, that's that was. Uh, I'll tell you, that was you know we we were just doing that episode last week with uh you know chris and neely uh from the classic metal show and you know we were going talking about the whole metallica fiasco but you know when this thing came this week this mr bungle thing i mean this thing i think just this, this is a whole different level i think this this scalping you know third party the stub hub that whole thing is really taken to because i mean you know i'll give it up to mike Patton. he did a really great job with the damage control you know because i mean he really should be applauded for adding those extra shows um, because it was going to become, I mean, if you saw what was going on online and everything, I mean, it was crazy. Well, yeah, now, so now they've added a show in each city. So they got two, in, uh, you know, in each New York, LA and San Francisco, because, you know, the reason was, I mean, obviously as you saw what was happening was the demand for these things was, was so, I mean, outrageous that these things were going, you know, the tickets were going for $200 a pop, uh, you know, up on StubHub and a lot of the, the, you know, the fans who were trying to buy the tickets, when they first were you know, being sold online, uh, basically were saying they were gone with less, in less than a minute. So, you know, Mike Patton, I give him a lot of credit. He came out, he, he, he came on social media, talked about that only 25% of the tickets were being released to the general public. And uh, so he was encouraging people, as well as Lombardo was doing the same thing, to, to get on there as soon as you can and get those tickets. But it, it went so fast because, uh, you know, you're talking about these shows are going to be in February. You're talking about a seven, seven months almost down the road well wait so 25 percent was available to the public yes so the 75 percent was going to StubHub. yep is that correct that is correct yes 
And now, who controls that? Is it the promoter that made uh, this decision? Well, uh, that's a th- I'm assuming. I'm assuming it's the promoter, which is the reason why they they went on. You know, they went online and they made that announcement. And of course, then it of course be- it became so internationally. It's live Nation, right? I don't know if live. I don't know if Live Nation is doing. I'm not sure which promoter actually is doing the bungle ones, but um, it, it's just it's it's absolutely you know it's pretty insane. I mean, talking about two hundred dollars a ticket, and nothing against Mr. Bungle. You know, I was a fan back in the day. I liked that first album, uh, but you know they're they're really sort of a like a novelty type of band. You know what I mean? They're not really. Uh, they had no mainstream success. They've had no MTV success. Obviously, it's it's a patent band, so he's got such a huge following, especially overseas, Australia, South America. You know, in the UK, those yeah. three places, insanely. Or well, you know. Oh, I was going to say, you know, because Vaughn had talked about that. I remember you mentioned that. And, uh, you know, I want to talk about 200 bucks a ticket. And mm-hmm. I went online, another L.A. show, tickets available for $45. That's because they so added, maybe that was after the yeah, show. They added the second shows, yeah, absolutely. Um, and now, we, like I said, that was, you know, obviously, like I guess I give Pat and, you know, because, you know, in the end, he is the one that has to say here, right? I mean, it's his band. Without him, there's, there's not, no one's playing. You know, um, and it doesn't help, I guess, when you've got a Lombardo and Scott Even, you know, it's a great a thing to have. Nothing against those guys at all. But when you're obviously that's going to just increase the demand and the price of the ticket automatically with those two guys playing with the band, you know, themselves. You know, it basically what it was become was a global hipster gathering for kids with mommy and daddy's, you know, American Express gold that's card. Cool. You know, that's and, what the are. Exactly. Stop, Eric. Yeah, I actually got my ticket uh, on the pre-sale day, which is the day before it went on sale to the public, and it was surprisingly easy. Um, I honestly don't know who's going to be at the show because Mr. Bungle fans, like you said, uh, are they're they're a niche group, um, and they have a tendency. And I I, I interviewed Trey for my for my online uh, music uh, website guy back in two thousand three or so. Uh, and Trey is a fantastic guitar player. All of those guys are, are fantastic in their own way. And I remember Trey telling me about when he, when Mr. Bungle played, it must have been after their, after their first album came out, said that they played in LA and they just, they have a tendency, they had a tendency at the time at least to do shows like to intentionally uh, provoke the audience and just make them angry. And uh, Trey had mentioned in the interview that Tom Moran was in the audience and uh, came backstage later on and was like, what are you guys doing? Like you are entertainers. You should have been putting on a better show. And Trey was just standing there like, my God, this is my hero <laughs> and he wasn't mm-hmm. happy with the show. So, um, it's, it's hard to tell for me who's going to actually be there. I guess uh, maybe scalp has brought them all up, but it's, uh, I don't know if it's folks who really knew that demo really well. And it's that small of a group or they're anthrax fans or Slayer fans or just metal fans. Or if it's just three shows that people from all around the world saw that, okay, there's only going to be three shows. I got to make it out. Cause, Bungle and Faith No More, they were big in Europe. They were big in Australia. Right. They didn't do as, like, Faith No More kind of calmed down in the States after Angel Dust, but um, they were still yeah. doing well everywhere outside mm-hmm. everywhere outside of the States. Sure. Mm-hmm. That's true. They were huge. Well, yeah, after the real, I think, you know, radio really pushed them as, as a novelty band when Epic became, uh, you, you, that was just heard constantly all over the radio. And then, uh, Angel Dust had a, had a couple songs, Midlife Crisis, and then they just got weirder and weirder. I loved their the latter Faith No More stuff, but it was definitely very uh, uncommercial as far as radio markability goes. But uh, I think they're going to build this as a super group. Seeing, you know, I'm, I'm sure the fact that Lombardo and Scott Ian are, are with them. I mean, it's the same thing with Misfits. Misfits back in yes. the I mean, Misfits mm-hmm. are times bigger now than they ever have Absolutely. been back in, in their prime days of that. You know, they do these giant, they never played arenas before, no. but they get, uh, you know, Dave Lombardo and they get Glenn Danzig back. And it's like, you know, build as like a once in a life, you know, misfits are back. And I think, they're going to probably either, you know, are they doing the same thing with this Mr. Bungle thing? No, absolutely. You know, and, and I think what it is, it also tells me that there's such a demand globally for for really not necessarily new music you know in new bands it's really for these nostalgic bands to come back and, and do these tours like you said a band like the misfits and that's a great example i mean the fact that they're playing st- you know arenas now <laughs> yeah, cause they would play the big clubs and stuff sure but i mean for them to be playing arenas just shows you 
that there is such a demand for, for, for nostalgia now. I mean, not that, you know, this always has been, of course, this isn't anything new, but it also, you know, it, it lets us know that what, what's going on for the, for the newer bands. I mean, it, it's going to be tough because if people are willing to, you know, put out, I mean, spend 200 bucks to see Mr. Bungle, nothing against, like I said, I, I like Mr. Bungle. There's no way I, I would even, I probably would even play, you know, a hundred dollars for them. I'll be honest with you. I mean, I like that one album they had, the first album. The other two albums were a lot different. It was a lot of, you know, it was really heavily influenced by uh, Pat, and it was more of his sort of style that he does with his other bands and everything. But, um, you know, I just, I kind of just don't, I see this sort of as like not really a great sign for, you know, the the future of new music because people are willing to, you know, they don't want to go out and spend a little, you know, say a hundred bucks. Like, you know, we were talking about this last week, Bob, you know, obviously with, with, on the last episode and how, you can go to a local show and see a bunch of new bands. We saw a bunch of great bands that night for, you know, sure. I mean, so cheap and you can have a great night. And, and it's like, but I don't think, I, I really think there's such a demand for, for, for the nostalgic bands to get back together, even if it's for a couple of shows. And, you know, like, like I said, the other thing too, like I'm just going to use an example. Um, and, and it has to do with Patton's, you know, uh, bandmates and faith, the more, you know, about three years ago, um, they did something very similar when they uh, did a reunion with their original singer for Faith and More, Chuck Mosley. And so they had, right. they had to show up here in San Francisco, and they also had one in L.A. And the way I think, I, the way they thought I did was great because they, obviously they knew the shows were going to you know, get, definitely going to sell out. So they didn't announce this until 24 hours before the first show here in San Francisco. They originally had the show announced as Chuck Mosley and Friends, and then 24 hours beforehand, they came out online. They did a big thing saying, we're going to do a basic a reunion. We're going to play songs from the first two albums. I mean, the show sold out. We got the tickets for like 40 bucks. There's no problem getting tickets. All the real fans that wanted to see the show went and saw it. They didn't plan it ahead for seven months. You know, so I think just sure. going forward, I think it's, it's a good idea for these bands. If they're going to do something like this. I mean, listen, and Mike Pat, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I don't think he probably knew the extent of the interest globally that that was going to take place and how, how much you know these these tickets were just going to explode and they're, you know they're real hardcore fans here in the states weren't going to be able to really get hold of those tickets unless they paid a fortune so uh you know i just think it's you know the way faith the morning did you know did it a few you know about three years ago was i think a great example on how you do it if you're going to do something like this where are they playing Leonard. in new york and la they're playing the they're playing the fonda in la and i don't remember where they're playing in new york but and the Fonda is not really not that big. Yeah, the Warfield fits like two thousand, I think. Mm-hmm. So I think yeah. it's smaller than the Fillmore, which I think fits three. So um, it's still it's still an intimate show. I'm just curious as to as to who's who's going to be going and and kind of the like what really the motivation was. I can't imagine the motivation was that was was you know whatever twenty five year old demo. God, how old is thirty five year old demo? Yeah. So, and, uh, have you heard that demo? <laughs> and it, you can't even really make it yeah, out. It's real to, basic, yeah. Sounds like Mr. Buttle. <laughs> Pickle, what do you, what, I, I what have you have to say about Pickle? You know, I don't know if we're going uh, opening another, uh, going down a rabbit hole or another can of worms, but you're talking about these bands with all the different members, and we were talking at dinner. You know, all the bands now seem like they become a tribute to themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, you have one member of a band out on tour with so many different members from somewhere else. And it's like, they're just a tribute to the original band out on tour. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That makes total well, sense. Yeah. I guess with Mr. Fungo, you're saying they have two of the original guys in there and then they just added Scotty in and Dave Lombardo. Is that correct? Yeah. There's the three, so three original members, including yeah. Patton and then, uh, yeah, Lombardo and, and Ian. Not, I, not to, not to go out to the left field, but you know, you look at Judas Priest, is it still Judas Priest? Or is it Rob Halford's Judas Priest? Or is it mm-hmm. a, a Judas Priest tribute, you know, or mm-hmm. Queensryche? Who's the, will the real Queensryche please stand up? Well, I mean, I at, least, well at least with those bands, they're still playing new music. You know, they're, they're putting out new music, new records. I mean, Mr. Bungle hasn't played a show in 20 years. They haven't put out new music in more than that. Like you said, that's even more of a tribute to themselves by doing that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. Well, everyone needs money, and they know that, that you know there's a demand for that, dude. I got to tell you, I was driving in. I was driving in L.A. down by uh, Dominguez Hills, and there was a pregame. I had no idea, but well, I didn't even know that that that's where the Chargers were playing in uh, Dominguez Hills. You know, they this isn't even the new arena. You know, they're opening up that new three billion dollar 
stadium where the Rams and the uh, Chargers are going to play next year. Mm-hmm. But this is at the old soccer stadium mm-hmm. uh, in Dominguez Hills where the Chargers are doing a preseason game today. Mm-hmm. Preseason game. And I drove by there and it said event parking, $100. Wow. wow. $100 for a fucking preseason oh, fucking game. Well, the winner of the fucking NFL is in the shit house. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but if, if, if you figure a hundred bucks per car, how many cars do you think? Ten thousand, five thousand cars, whatever. That's crazy. I mean, do the math. I, somebody's making, you know, and this is just not parking. You know, I, I see like this, all these people, like this pilgrimage of people walking blocks and blocks, because of course nobody wants to pay that shit. Mm-hmm. You know. So they're probably parking all in, you know, shopping centers. But it, that just blew my fucking mind. And it's getting, I mean, not just with music and concerts, but with sporting events. And what, what's going to happen when the regular season starts and they start in this $3 billion uh, fucking stadium? Is parking going to be $300 fucking dollars? I mean, fuck, yeah, who weird. has this money to go to a show or go to a uh, ball game? I mean, that's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous, yeah. Bob, you know what I need you to do as you're saying this? I need you to I need you to send me a photo of you sitting in a chair on your lawn and shaking your cane at all the kids who are walking by your lawn on the sidewalk. I'm I'm only a few years away from that. And this has to do with everybody. <laughs> So should we? Uh, you want to move on from this, or Matt? You want to take over as since you're going to be the new. Uh, the new main host. Am anyway. I might might the new? Well. That might be the new uh, Maven of Metal here. But you, there's only one Armenian Maven of Metal, man. That's you, Bob. You know that. Yeah. yeah. So passing the cunt. <laughs> <laughs> I may end up being a fake producer myself. <laughs> yeah. hey, he's not wrong with that. Not wrong with the fake producer, man. <laughs> I know. On the last podcast, the one we had with with uh, Neely and Chris, we obviously talked about the. Metallica fiasco with Live Nation. Yeah. I was wondering, what was it? Have you since then heard any outcome of, of that? I know um, uh, Metallica have denied it. Like I said, I, I, I think Metallica probably, uh, you know, they just, they had their fucking guarantee. And, and beyond that, a lot of these artists themselves, they don't know, you know, how the finances are distributed or, or all that. But I'm just wondering if there was any follow up on well, that. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, it's Congress, so of course, you know, that came from Congress, so you know how long Congress takes to do anything. So, no, I mean, I've, I haven't heard anything um, about that since. I, that was just, I don't know if that was just such like a, a virtual signal that they did there to kind of, you know, whatever they were doing, but I mean, no, I, there hasn't been anything since. You know, of course, Metallica's smart enough, they're, they're just going to keep their mouths shut. Their mouths shut, I mean, I mean, what, what's the, you know, they're already. They already have that stigma against them, right? That they're these greedy guys, and you know they're so they're just going to probably keep quiet. You said they got their guarantee. They're just like go ahead and talk. But no, there hasn't been. I haven't. I haven't heard anything unless uh, someone else has. Otherwise, hey Matt, where are you from? Uh, New York, originally. What part? Queens. Uh, I'm from Connecticut. It sounds like you're oh, right, nice. right out of New Haven. Yeah, that's well, not hey, that yeah. far away. Yeah, not that far at all. Exactly oh, yeah. like my cousin Mutt. <laughs> Mutt? Mutt. Mutt? <laughs> <laughs> Fong Duck Dong, what's your, what's your, uh, did you have anything to say? Yeah, you know, I have a really hard time believing that Metallica even knew anything that was going on. And I, I seriously, I seriously doubt they knew. I couldn't imagine them even caring. Um, I don't think that, I mean, even looking back to number one, their Garage Days album, where they put on it the 598 EP so that nobody could charge right. more than 598. And number two, Looking back to some kind of monster, the phone call that James and Lars and Kirk had with their manager, the, where Clear Channel was saying that they need to do this commercial, and James flat out said, you mean we need to do this commercial or they're not going to play our music? They're going to hurt us? And Cliff said, yes. And James said, I'm glad that this is your job. And that says a lot about, number one, how well their manager has protected them from that sort of stuff, and number two... If they didn't know about that sort of stuff, I mean, you know that's how Clear Channel works. That's nothing new. So yeah, I really don't think that they they even, number one, knew what was going on, and number two, cared enough about the dollars and cents to say We're, we'll play for this amount of money or that amount of money. I think everything they do now is for fun because they enjoy it, and I, I really don't think that there's any need for them to, to you know nickel and dime their fans or anybody else. What did you think about them putting a stop to that Canadian uh, tribute band from touring? It was a Canadian Metallica tribute band. 
I didn't hear Did you that. Hear I actually that? haven't even heard. No. Tell, no, tell me about it. Because there's a bunch of Metallica tribute. No, there was. There was. I, I I wish I had it in front of me. I could probably Google it. There was a about a year ago. There was a band out of Canada. They were like a, a huge Metallica tribute uh, band that was touring all over Canada, and they wanted to come to the United States. And I think there there might have even been a lawsuit or something involved. They Metallica was like said, "No, you guys are not going to do this." I know the Stones. Yeah, I did that with Sticky Fingers and. Yeah. Uh, and even Bon Jovi did that with the Blonde Jovi, the all-female Bon Jovi uh, tribute band. Bon Jovi. Put I, I don't think we should even it. mention Bon Jovi in this podcast. <laughs> well, I'm just making a point. <laughs> I've heard those bands. I, I, I didn't hear this about Metallica because I know there's a million Metallica tribute bands that are fairly successful, at least locally. But this is news to me. Huh. Yeah, in Good. fact, there was one Metallica. There was one Metallica tribute band out there that. Um, I remember reading a story about a, a while ago um, where James actually saw them and asked them, "Hey, how do you guys do Shortest Straw?" Because they had never, they had not played. I think they hadn't played Shortest Straw live in a long time, and so he wanted to see how they did it. Okay, go ahead and read this, Pickle. Yeah, they were called uh, Sandman. It says uh, Metallica says we hear that Sandman's Canada's tribute to Metallica is a little upset with us, and with a little digging, figured out why. So I'd have to uh, I'd have to dig into the article to get the actual uh, uh, so statement. Maybe it wasn't Metallica. Oh, it's actually in Rolling Stone magazine. Oh, wow. Wow. wow, there you go. Thirsty Spickle knows more about the biz than uh, you guys do. Uh, <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> I'm just here drinking beer. Yeah, the, 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 the inner workings of the music biz are all within the cover, all within the pages of Rolling Stone. That's all you need to know. <laughs> here it is. Yeah. It says uh, Metallica, Canadian cover band, reconcile over cease and desist letter. Band apologizes after overzealous attorney sent cover band Sandman forty-one page letter. Wow! So there you go. See there, what, what, dude? When you're when you're at the stage of Metallica, you got so. I mean, ACDC is a prime example. I mean, I, I know Lars and James; they're very business savvy when it comes to business and and being involved in everything. But I know with ACDC, Angus and, 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 you know, when Malcolm was alive, you know, their, their, their uncle or brother, it was all family, the young, and they just trusted their family uh, to, to run the business. They, they didn't want any business about music. They just wanted to play and have fun and be musicians, which it should be really, but you have to have trust and faith in your uh, business partners and your attorneys and managers and agents. But when you get to the level of ACDC, where you're a corporate powerhouse, I mean, they are the epitome of corporate when it comes to merchandise, T-shirts, you know, jingles, songs on TV commercials. I mean, they are a corporate powerhouse. There's no way the artist could be in control or know everything that's going on, especially someone like that. And I think, you know, Metallica is getting to that, to that point where, you know, they're not going to be aware of every Metallica tribute out worldwide. I mean, sure. uh, you know, there's, I was talking to somebody about a stand alcoholic and they said, Oh, well, there's two alcoholicas. There's one in the Bay area and there's one in LA. They're totally different bands. So <laughs> sure. You've got to figure there's a Metallica tribute band in every fucking major cities. But that's your point. I mean, they're, they're at that level. Why would they even give a fuck? Well, I, I, I that right. yeah. what the attorneys saying it, uh, I mean, the, you know, attorneys are if, if they figure it's going to dig into their income. They're going to, you know, but, but then uh, again, why are the house of blues sold out all the time with tribute bands? Every show you see now at the house of blues, it's a tribute to so-and-so. Yeah. And it's packed. Mm -hmm. Where, are, where's the original band and why aren't they playing house of blues? Cause they only got one original member <laughs> and they are a tribute band. <laughs> They're a tribute to themselves. And they don't sound they don't yeah. sound as they don't sound as good as the tribute band anymore. Well, a lot of them don't. It's true. You know, I mean, look at Foreigner. They don't have any original members. They're a tribute band, but they well, mm -hmm. they go the name. Yeah. yeah, but he plays like one out of every ten shows with them. Really? If that, yeah. Jeez. He only does the a big the big festival shows or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. I'm joining the tribute band. There you go. There you go. Biggest, let's take a consensus of everyone here. Who's the biggest rock band in the world? Bobo. You mean metal band? Any band. Here, period. Who's the biggest well, rock I mean, band? Rock you know, band? I, you mean now mm. or over time? I mean, that's oh, still over, touring. No, they're the Rolling no, Stones. Just, okay. They're still around. All right, the Stones. They're playing this weekend. All right, Fong? Yeah, I mean, it depends. I, it depends on current bands today playing. It's got probably the Stones, maybe, maybe okay. McCartney. All right, we got two Stones, one McCartney. I, Matt? I would have to, if, I mean, 
probably say I, I'd have to give it to Metallica. I think Metallica is still probably the, arguably the biggest band in the, in the world. Wow, bigger than the Stones, bigger than Aerosmith, I, it, bigger it, than Paul McCartney. I, well, I, I, I think I think they can draw just as just as much as any anybody can. Absolutely. They did sell out the Rose Bowl where the Stones are playing. Uh, I don't know if it was sold out, but I was at the because Metallica Rose Bowl. I, I think a lot of people don't want to be like, not, not for nothing. Like my, myself, Percy. I mean, yeah, when the Who came and played, I was like, you know, I, I not, and it's no offense to him, but I don't want to watch a bunch of guys in their seventies that could barely move playing that stuff. Metallica is still young enough, still you know hitting it hard. I mean, I, I would for me, I'd buy a Metallica ticket over a Stone ticket, but that's also you know I didn't I didn't you know I grew up. Yeah, you know, in a different generation, of course, in the '80s and stuff. So in the '90s, so um, I probably have a different answer to that than if I grew up a little earlier. You know, if I was, you know, if I was Bob's age with the cane, you know. Yeah, Iron Maiden <laughs> is uh, <laughs> is uh, you know going to be coming around to LA soon. I've talked to people on the East Coast. They said Iron Maiden now is sounding better than they have in the last. And you know, not to mention they're playing all their greatest hits, which right. everyone mm-hmm. wants to hear. But they said. Sound wise, Dickinson sounds better than he has in the past. They're moving around like crazy. Hopefully, that doesn't apply to Yannick Gears. Hopefully, he is mellowing down like crazy. Um, inside joke, maybe you guys haven't seen Yannick Gears on stage. I don't know. Uh, I have, yeah. <laughs> but he prances around like Ingrid oh, yeah. Malmsteen on stage. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, everyone's saying that Maiden is sounding great and they're selling out everywhere. So, you know, I, I agree. The, the bands that are able to do it physically and, and musically and still have, you know, pretty much the core of Iron Maiden has been the same since 1983. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. so um, that's, that's a testament to, I mean, that's, you know, they're one of those few bands, them and Metallica, that have remained pretty much the original bands, you know, obviously Metallica with, with Cliff passing, you know, I'm talking original bands since the, uh, their debut records, obviously sure. Maiden had a ton of lineups before their debut, but you know, it, that, I think that matters a lot and seeing that there's original bands still touring out there in, in metal. I think it's fantastic. If they could still sound good and play good, fuck it. Have them carry on till they're 70. Oh, absolutely. There's only one. Oh, yeah. There's only one Iron Maiden tribute band that anyone's ever heard of. The Iron, the Maidens. Iron Maidens. Exactly. Yep. There you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Actually, there's a lot. They're the biggest. For they're sure, the biggest. And they're out there making a living. Yeah. You know? yeah. Dude, there's a documentary there about them. I don't That's know if insane. you've seen. Uh, a, the documentary is actually about their roadie, which is kind of weird. But, oh. <laughs> but he said, but yeah, I, I saw that on. Prime I, yeah, I saw that. I remember seeing them years ago in San Diego. I was blown away by them. They're they're fucking awesome, man. Yeah, there's a they're reason. Really yeah, I know them really well from the Phantom Blue. You know, they started <laughs> as kind of uh, like two or three of the the girls from Phantom Blue as it's just a side project, mm-hmm. and boom, it carried on. I'm going to start an all male tribute to the Go Go's, <laughs> <laughs> the guy guys, right? In, yeah, the bro bros. The bro bros, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do we have uh, another topic to discuss? Well, yeah, we. Uh, yeah, we were. You're, you're supposed to control this discussion. I am you're, here, you're man. You know, I'm just giving you shit. Now I know. You're the main man. Uh, we're changing Matt's name to Mutt. <laughs> Mutt. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, 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 we were going to do the uh, talk about the uh, uh, the bio uh, picks and the documentaries. Well, now right? the saying, obviously, you know, the Elton John biopic came out. Of course, the Queen made record sales everywhere. So that's, mm-hmm. you know, going to be the new thing with the biopics. I know there's an Aussie one in the works, Aussie Black Sabbath. They've, they've been working on that for a while. So, yeah, there's going to be a lot more of those. And I think they're going to take over a lot of the documentary films because documentaries, you know, I should know, being a, a director of documentaries, it, now there there's millions of them coming out, especially since Prime and there's so many digital outlets mm-hmm. that – We'll have them for free, um, mm-hmm. so it makes it you know, easy access for a lot of uh, documentary filmmakers. But I think the biopics, you're going to start seeing a lot more of those coming out, sure. and I don't think they're going to be very good. You know, they were doing that with VH1 for a while. You remember they had the one with Millie Vanilli, they had the one with yeah. Meat Loaf, mm-hmm. and they were just like VH1 specials kind of. And they were pretty horrible. And now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, so was the Motley Crue one. Oh, uh, horrendous, horrendous. The, the, uh, yeah. the, De- the Def Leppard one was really good with Anthony Michael Hall as Mutt Lang. That one was good. You know, I never I seen never that one. That, but yeah. That, and that was like a VH1 thing too, right? Yeah, it was good. It should, you should yeah. probably be able to find it on YouTube, but uh, it was it was it was quite entertaining. You should see it. 
Well, I mean, the thing well, about what are your thoughts. What's that? See, look at I'm still taking up. I'm still the main man. See, Bob, I can't. I can't get. I can't. I can't. I'm trying, man. You get. You still love me, man. I'm kidding. I can't help it. It's just a habit. <laughs> uh, yeah, Eric. Eric, why don't you go ahead and yeah, talk about? I guess. Uh, what you? Yeah. Think well, about did you that? guys see? Did you guys see Bohemian Rhapsody? I haven't. I did. Yeah. What did you think, Bob? Well, we we talked about this on a previous one. I I came in to expect the worst, and I thought it was just going to be all about. Freddie Mercury and just just this fluff movie about you know appealing to the young audience and well after reading about it, I wasn't so surprised seeing that all the you know surviving members of Queen were involved uh, but I was kind of surprised that they showed that Queen was an equal band which a lot of people don't realize everyone thinks it was Freddie Mercury he was the mastermind I mean obviously a fantastic vocalist and he was the front man but. Yeah, we were just talking about We Will Rock You. That was a Brian May song. Most of their biggest hits were either written by Brian May or John Deacon. Yeah, he, he actually yeah. wrote their yeah. biggest, like everyone bites it up. So he actually had the most number one songs. Obviously, Freddie did, you know, was one of the main guys behind Bohemian Rhapsody and all that. But they were pretty much an equal band. Of, you know, Roger Taylor sang a lot of the songs, too. So mm-hmm. I'm glad that they portrayed it as, as a band and they went back to the early years. Although the timeline was kind of fucked up and they skipped through a lot of stuff, but I was surprised they did as much as they did. And you know, the guy that played Freddie Mercury, he was a damn good actor. I thought he did a really good job and it was well done. It was, you know, uh, they had a lot of money behind them, obviously, but it was for what it was. I thought it was well done. Well, he was the only yeah. good actor in the, I think with that budget, they could have maybe, you know, cast a little bit uh, higher an a squad acting uh, cast. The acting was horrible, but the movie was awesome. And and that, I thought it, and I thought it was fantastic, and I, and I think that at, at the end of the day, what it does is it's great for the music because it exposes new audiences to Queen. Like my wife said that she never really listened to that much Queen until you know she started dating me, and my mom went through the Queen catalog again. I mean, it's the same effect from you know Glee and American Idol and The Voice. Yeah. You know, mainstream audiences are exposed to brand new songs, and it's just the same thing with like every TV show that's on, right? There's an hour long show. And at the end, there's this song that, that gets brand new song that gets played at the end of the show to kind of capture everything. And, and, you know, streams and sales spike after those sorts of things. So the movie, even though, uh, the, the timeline may not be to your liking, Mr. Nabandian, the, the, the music will sell, the music will sell nicely after that. Well, I think this is going to be the new business model. The music, the music business, they're looking for new ways to earn an income, obviously because of the CD sales and all the streaming. So they've conquered the touring. They've conquered the music licensing. You see more and more, you know, even bands from the 80s on, on commercials these days, you know, uh, TV commercials and whatnot. And you're going to see a lot more of that stuff. And I think the biopics are going to be the, their new way of seeing because just what you said is exposing Queen to a whole new bright exposing them to the Hollywood audience, to the movie audience, which, uh, you know, there's been movies about that stuff before. And I remember back, you know, when I was growing up more of documentaries than it was. Well, you had movies that weren't specific. I remember an example was The Rose, which was loosely based on Janis Joplin. And they even redid that recently, I heard. I didn't see it, but uh, the original one was with Bette Midler and, that was kind of based on Joplin. And, then, you know, there, there, there were movies of that, about that during the day, but I think they probably had licensing issues to use the person's name but or their, their likeness, so they kind of, you know, steal the story. Basically, like what Rockstar did with Judas Priest, you know. Uh, Judas Priest did, did not want them to uh, do it, so they just basically stole the, you know, parts of the Judas Priest story with Ripper Owens and used it as their own god-awful movie. And, for, you know, some people consider that a biopic, which is That's not. a great fucking movie. What are you talking about? Rockstar? Are you serious? Yeah. I want you like that? that time. Jeez, that's Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> 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 so, Fong, with, with that being said, we have to bring up the Elton movie. What's your take? I actually haven't seen it, uh, but I'd love to see it. Um, I'm an Elton John fan. I'd, I'd absolutely see it. I'm, I'm yeah, married yeah. with two kids. I don't, I don't get out much, but I'll absolutely see it. 
Well, you can probably get it on uh, Netflix or something right at this point. No, not yet. It's it's still. Or we going to be a fucking download on cable. You can well, watch the damn movie. Watch the movie, Fong. We'll I will. Yeah, have you guys? Have you no, seen it? What do you What do you think? Uh, well, let's do this. Like, just watch it, and then we'll take it up on the next podcast. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. Either. I've heard all the reviews, and I've heard about it. I, I really have no no really desire. I mean, I love Elton's music, his history with the music. Him and Bernie Top and all that. I heard the, the the biopic didn't cover any of that. It's just about his personal life. That's fine, but I, I don't I don't care to see that. I I was a fan of Elton's music. I want to see his musical history. How could you not like rock stuff? Movie was bad. Are you serious? No, I think you're serious. You were joking. That was a great movie. Jennifer Aniston looked hot. All right, would, would somebody <laughs> back me up here? <laughs> oh. Well, my thing on, on the take on the biopics. As I, don't, I don't. I don't really think they're so. They're. they're, they're I think they're pretty good for s- sort of mainstream artists, like you said, Elton John, or even even the Queen type, because they did have a lot of top forty hits and stuff. But in terms of hard rock and metal bands, I'm not a huge fan of them. I think a lot of it, you know, it can kind of distort and sort of have like a, put, put a negative spin or outlook on a band. I mean, just look at the Motley Crue one, right? A good, great example is you know totally. in, in the dirt, right in the book, that whole scene with the Nikki mm-hmm. Six and Tommy Lee with with the. The check where she thinks it's you know Nikki and it's Tommy, so he essentially basically rapes her, right? Well, that's something so, someone's you know we, that was out there for years. No one said anything. But we've got you know cultural changes and norms and values and stuff happen, and so now you're going back. You're looking at something that was just kind of you know not a big deal back then. Now everyone's like, whoa, look at this. So I, I think with sure. you know with, with uh, and also a lot of it with Hollywood. I mean, how, let's be honest. I mean, Hollywood. They're, they have an agenda, and it's what they're looking, you know, for what's going to sell, not what's real, right? So producers and writers, they might a lot of them aren't fans of metal. They're not fans of hard rock. So they could paint the artist in a band, whatever light they want. You know, and another thing is, too, for instance, like, Bobby, you were talking about how uh, there's one in the works for Ozzy. Well, I mean, can you imagine what that one's going to look like? Because you know Sharon's got her hands in everything. So all she's going to do is, I mean, she can go on there and make a biopics, you know, smearing the people she wants to smear, whether it be Bob Daisley and Jakey e. Lee, Bruce Dickinson, all these people she's had beef with over the years, right? She can make this biopic. And then, you know, people look at biopics as more of the real story, right? And in the end, that's like the real legacy, right? Whatever comes out of Hollywood. Whereas documentaries, really, they, you, you get the takes on all different, you know, you get it from the, the, the stories from all the different sides. Exactly. Well, that's true. It's all Hollywood. I don't know if we uh, mentioned it on a podcast, Matt. Uh, one of the guys, I won't mention his name, one of the guys that was on a previous Skull Sessions not too long ago uh, is really close with the Motley Crue guys. He went to interview, he did a big feature for one of the biggest worldwide metal magazines. This is a guy that grew up with Motley Crue since they're Too Fast for Love era, even in the clubs before then. And he was told by the producers that everything had to go through Netflix. That means all his questions had to go through Netflix. And he's like, what the fuck? I'm not interviewing Netflix. I'm Mm -hmm. interviewing Motley Crue. Yes, but you're interviewing them about the dirt. So we need to get all the questions. He's like, fuck that. I don't do this. Mm -hmm. And then I guess Vince called him up because they were close friends and said, look, we'll work around this. Don't worry. This is, you know, but that just shows how much control that they control your interviews, the interviews that are being taken. They don't want any questions that are going to cause any kind of negative feedback to the movie. And they said that straight up. We don't want anything negative going out about this movie. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the guy's like, dude, you're some young fucking punk at uh, in Netflix that probably hasn't even fucking heard of the band. Don't fucking tell me how to do interviews, you know. But, you know, you're going to see a lot more of that if this if there's going to get this crossover of music into the uh, Hollywood mainstream. But that's the difference between a documentary and a movie. It's two very different things. Absolutely. True. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts, Fong Duck Dong? Um, I think it's uh, – well, I think the interesting thing is when you see how – content is changing and you know podcast creators like yourselves are being captured up by the spotify's and the pandora's and the apple music it's really about owning the content regardless of whether it's good <laughs> it's or accurate it's about mm-hmm. gobbling as mu- gobbling up as much content as you can with the hope that you know oh, as a provider down. or as I'm a content down. owner you have more content exclusive content available than anybody else. And if somebody wants to see whatever content you own, they have to subscribe through you. 
Well, That's you think, true. I, the only thing that uh, Spickle heard from you is the words gobbling up, and he got <laughs> all excited. Uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. Uh, that was good. Beat that one, Spickle. Uh, I, I agree, Fong. What, what's your thoughts there, Matt? No, refer to Matt as Cousin Mott. Cousin Mott. What's your thoughts? <clears throat> no, it's it, it, that's exactly like basically what I was just getting to before. I mean, you know, the, my thing with documentaries versus biopics, one of the other things, too, is that you're mentioning there's, there's very little money exchange, right, with documentaries. I mean, Bob, I, I think you've mentioned, right, most of your, your guests in your documentaries, you're not paying the money, right? You're, you're just trying to get the facts. You're trying to get the story, the true story from all sides, right? Where, you know, the biopics, it's, it's all about getting the biggest name. To get on there, right? They're, they're not looking. I mean, they don't want to hear, like you said, about what some little manager or producer did. If it's if it doesn't fit their agenda of the story they want to tell, it's more about you know the important names. Not really getting not getting the story. Just getting, um, like I said, just really what's going to sell. What's going to you know, like the Motley Crew? I mean, we we saw that thing. I mean, the thing about that Motley Crew biopic to me was that all that stuff we saw. Now we already knew about that stuff. Everybody knew about that. I mean, there wasn't really anything in there, I think, that was like, oh, wow, this really happened. Because the other thing, too, especially going forward, right? We've got YouTube and everything. I mean, everyone's got a phone in their hand. You, you, can, you can have, you know, going forward with these rock and metal bands, you can, you, we don't need any more biopics in the future because we already got all the real footage. I mean, nothing gets mixed yeah, but anymore. The younger crowd or even the Hollywood crowd that's not familiar with Motley Crue that much, that haven't read the book or know about their antics of all the shit they did in the past or even mm. know who they are. Yeah, that's kind of a new thing. And seeing that it's on, you know, something like Netflix, which everyone has Netflix now, and if it's for free, you know, it's going to get a big viewership of a lot of people that might not know who the fuck they are. But I agree. Oh, no, I, I agree. I agree for the bands themselves. Yeah, there's no – if you're looking to – you said broad your audience like Eric was talking about earlier, obviously to get, you know, to, to get yourself a main, you know, more of a mainstream audience and to branch out, you know, of course you're going to do it. I mean, why not? On top of getting, you know, getting a lot of money from it and everything else, well, of course. I mean, I'm not saying for the bands themselves it's not good for them. I mean, obviously, you know, fiscally, financially, it's fantastic. Uh, like you said, f- to increase their fan base, you know, increase their, you know, their, their brand awareness and, and visibility and it just to enhance their overall legacy. Absolutely. You know, and a lot of the, uh, the biopics, like it's one thing if you're doing a biopic, like, for instance, I remember the big one, right, that I remember as, as, as a youngster in high school was The Doors when that came out. Right, I was just going to be this big thing. Oh, you know, yeah, Val, okay. Val Kimmer, he did a great job, but but you know, and it was different because Jim Morrison was dead. You know, Motley Crue, these guys are yeah. all still alive. You know what I mean? So it's like I can. Well, just... you know, like, yeah, I'm sorry, I was going to say, Steve, yeah, no. which, there's been like two or three biopics on Jimi Hendrix, which really didn't do one. I think one was with Andre 2000, and they went straight to Netflix or something. Mm-hmm. And it didn't get any hype like the Motley Crue one got. Mm-hmm. And it makes you wonder how much money, because I mean, with something like the Queen movie, that's you know, obviously doing a theatrical thing or the Elton John movie, that's huge money to go into the theater. That's a, but how much money are these artists mm-hmm. actually doing if it's straight to Netflix, Netflix. which is free? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure they get, you know, a, a good portion or, you know, per views or whatever, but it's obviously not as much as, at the actor, and you could tell by the budget too that it's not. But you know, again, that Motley Crue movie—they were shopping for years. That was Paramount. Years, I believe that mm-hmm. originally signed on. They turned them down, and you know, like Net- Netflix was like their last resort, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was like f- like fourteen years in the making. I think it's been in the making forever. Yeah, yeah. That, that, but yeah, continue what you were saying about the Doors because that is actually because that was Oliver Stone, and that was like a big budget movie. Yeah, no, like I said, I think that was really the original, I mean, the one that really, you know, kind of opened the, no pun intended, door to a lot of all these other biopics going forward. I mean, there, there was some there was some good ones. I mean, the, the one on, um, uh, what's his face, on Johnny Cash was pretty decent, walked the line. I thought that was pretty decent. Oh, yeah. Once again, no, he, he was, he, he, you know, um, I don't know if he was... Uh, dead yet at that time because it was about mid 2000s i don't know if he was gone yet or nothing but uh like i said i i totally understand doing a biopic obviously when, when these members are no longer around uh my thing is like a band like motley Crue. we we, we know their story they're all still alive you can interview them you know they're always telling different stories anyway i mean how many different uh versions of stories does nikki six have for basically everything you know what i mean 
So um, I, I guess it just took me. I, I'm I'm a documentary guy um, all the way. Just straight up because, I guess I said, maybe because we're just more music junkies. You know, we're not just a casual yeah. fans. Maybe for casual kind of fans, I get the biopics are great because they're not going to look deep into, you know, reading articles and looking into a lot of the history of the bands and the members and so forth. You know, music junkies like all four of us here, different stories. So, I mean, I guess in that way, too, the biopics are good. Um, I just, to me, it just doesn't give really the, the, the real picture of the band overall in terms of, you know... Uh, it, it just highlights, like you said, highlights all the, I guess, the exciting or the uh, more, what's, I, don't, I can't think of a word, but um, the more interesting facts or interesting events that occurred through, you know, throughout their uh, musical careers more so, you know, than focusing actually on the music. And I mean, the, and the other thing too about the biopics is, is you, the time constraints, right? You only got about an hour and a half to tell the whole life story of Motley Crue or whatever. You're not going to get much in there, well, you know? I, I agree with you 100, percent but that's the difference between, you know, a biopic is a movie, and a documentary is a documentary. It's two very different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like you said, the biopic. Let me ask you. Yeah, 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 go ahead. A kind of off topic, but not really, because there's a point to this. Have any, any of you guys seen that new Tarantino movie, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? I haven't. Yet. No, not yet. I'm going to see it next week. I think. I've okay. seen it. Go ahead. Well, you want us to give you the spoilers, or you probably know all about it. Well, well, hey, hey, cousin Matt, just for a second, going back to the biopic versus a documentary, you know, a biopic is a movie. It's an entertainment. Yes. You know, Mm -hmm. where a documentary is is an actual, you know, it's somewhat fact based. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's an information program. Uh, where where a biopic is is it's a movie. It's, oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, and I I guess my 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 argument though is, is that. Because of that entertainment, you're not really the, the because the, the biopic is gonna that's gonna be people are gonna look at the biopic as this is the story, this is the legacy of the band, you know. Even if, even even though it's right. based around the entertainment factor, which like you said, absolutely, it's it's meant to entertain. It's not really it's not more informational. It's more entertaining, like you said. But unfortunately, what right. happens because it is Hollywood and it's got the big money behind it, and it's gonna have all the attention. People are going to look at that and say, "This is the real story." Where I think a lot of it, it really isn't, and unfortunately for the for the right, no, yeah, this story. Well, well that's my right. point. So, yeah. I, I want to think about this once upon a time in Hollywood, um, and I'm not going to spoil it for you, Funk, sir. But the point is, is sure. that the last few Tarantino movies, uh, as well, the slave one and the Nazi one, it was all about changing of history. And when you watch this once upon a time in Hollywood, of course, it's about the changing of history. You know, the whole Manson murders, but it's a whole reversal on what what could have happened. And, you know, that. but the one thing that they do is they use parts of real incidents and real people in this and they distort the fuck out of it. Like a, a perfect example is in, in the movie and Once Upon a Time of Hollywood, there's a whole scene with Bruce Lee. And they made him out to look like a complete fucking idiot, like an arrogant asshole that that picks a fight with the character who's Brad Pitt, who's a stunt person. And supposedly if from what I, I I was never a big martial arts guy, but from what I heard about uh, Bruce Lee, he never picked fights. He walked, he he didn't fight in public. That was like the martial arts laws. You didn't, you know, have to prove yourself to be, and they made him out like this real arrogant asshole picking a fight with him. And I hear the Lee family is very, very pissed off about that. And, and, and people that don't know anything about Bruce Lee, let's say he died back in the 70s. Nobody knows his legacy or what about. People are going to look at that and say, hey, is, is this how Bruce Lee was? And then he met, mentioned a thing about uh, Muhammad Ali. Oh, yeah, I could kick Muhammad Ali's ass. And in reality, I guess the daughter or the granddaughter, the granddaughter, I guess, of Bruce Lee was saying, uh, you know, Bruce had the utmost respect for Muhammad Ali. They were good friends. He would have never have said that. But my point is, that's the whole thing, is this whole changing of history, what you're seeing going on in everything from politics and now in the music industry and now into film. Is mm-hmm. They could change, you could take a basic storyline and just distort the fuck out of it. And knowing the guys at Motley Crue and even reading the book back when it came out, The Dirt, I was reading through it going, this is bullshit, this is bullshit, this is bullshit. When you have the band putting together a movie... They're going to make it out for them to be these superheroes. You know, they're yep. going to obviously make mm-hmm. them to look good. The greatest biopic that I, and, and I'll give props to my good friend, Jonas Auckland, who did Lords of Chaos. You had an outsider 
that knew about the whole black metal scene, death metal scene. I mean, this is the uh, Jonas, for those that don't know, even though he's one of the biggest Hollywood video directors out there, he was the original drummer in the band Bathory, one of the original death metal bands. He grew up on the whole death metal, black metal scene. He's from Sweden. He knew all about that. But he's an outsider. He's not going to make this VAR guy look like a hero. He's going to tell the story how it is, talk to all the people around, and give a very truthful, uh, you know, of course, you know, a lot of the black metal people, you know, are, are you know, want his blood. Oh, this is, this is making the black metal scene look bad. All right, no, Bandy, hold on. That was a very powerful, that was a very powerful. Well, thank you. Let's, let's get back to the movie. Well, that is a movie. All that right. is a bio. All right. It, on, it, on, it, it was a movie. And if you guys watch that movie, that was one of the funniest scenes in that movie when Bruce Lee's character fought Brad Pitt. It was, but is it, but was it, it true? No, it's a fucking movie. It's not a documentary. But my Bruce point Lee's is, life. they're using a real person and they're to portray because they're trying yeah, to but it was a portray movie. fiction. It's entertainment. I, I agree with you there, but they're still distorting the guy's likeness. And I say, but before you would have to, like I mentioned that movie, The Rose, all right, that's about Janis Joplin, but they didn't say it was her. It was right. kind of, it yeah. kind of paralleled her lifestyle. Yeah. But using Bruce Lee and making him look out to be this, I mean, I can understand why the family would be upset that they didn't, they said, hey, they didn't tell us. Uh, and I know you haven't seen the movie Fong or uh, that. Like, have you, you seen like, it? You sound like a snowflake right now. It's a movie. Dude, it was entertainment. It was funny as fuck. Funny or not, they, but but you see, a lot of people don't look at movies as like entertainment. An you yeah. got a lot of a lot Did of. He not look like an asshole. He, he looked like an asshole, and Did Brad he, Brad Pitt kicked his ass. It was funny. As well, that, yeah, that was kind of funny. It was a movie. It wasn't a documentary. No, but they're trying to make it out like it's based on how his attitude was and how he was. In real life, yeah, a lot, a lot of viewers right. they're not going to be able to determine between, like you said, Lenny, a movie and entertainment. They're just going to see Bruce Lee thinking, "Oh, this is this is how Bruce Lee was," you know, because they a lot of right. I mean, listen. We know a lot of, a lot of people believe true. Hollywood; they believe it. Of course, <laughs> so, it was a funny character, and it would have been just as funny. It would have been just they, as good, but they didn't reference him as Bruce Lee. Yeah, uh, no, they referenced him as Bruce. Wow, oh, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> You guys have to, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give it a quick overview of the movie. It was, I'm a, I'm a Tarantino fan. The movie was way too long, way too, way too long. And it wasn't that great. It was okay. It was okay. It was best. okay at best. I agree with you. Yeah. But that scene with Bruce Lee is funny as fuck. And it was one of the best scenes in the movie. <laughs> All right. Well, regardless, it was funny. I agree. It was, it was kind of a funny scene, but the fact that they are using a real person to no, they, yeah, they assimilated yeah. kind of that no, and, that and he, of course anyone that knows Bruce Lee or of him would would lean to that was him obviously well they're saying that he trained Sharon Tate which he did in, in her movies and that's I mean everything is leading to yes <laughs> right and it, it was obvious it was and like there's no him. question that it's not but again it was a Tarantino movie yeah I know and he changes the reality but you know that's a lazy fucking way to write a movie and I say that for the last movie that he did with the with the slaves and the other thing it's like all right there's no it just shows there's no creativity in Hollywood just like in the music business we're going to take a, a, a story in history, and I'm just going to fuck with it and do a little change. Well, right. It's called end. a fucking movie. Yeah, but I'm saying the it's movie, movie. sucks. It's no creativity. Because <laughs> right. Pulp Fiction was fucking brilliant. You can say whatever you want about that. Reservoir Dogs, you know, I'm hearing now how much he ripped off from well, Chinese then, movies. I didn't see the original Chinese movies. Then why don't you write a movie? Maybe I fucking will. Hey, guys, are we movie. talking about movies or music here? What, what's the, what's, what are we doing? <laughs> I was just telling Bob to write his own movie for us yeah. to go watch. Well, I, I did. did. I did three of them. Fine, you watched one. You were in one of the goddamn movies. You ungrateful fucking bastard. Tarantino's overrated, okay? There you go. Fuck it. It was a dumb scene. Why don't you write a fucking... I pro, might fucking do write that. a pro-Bruce Lee did. fucking movie. I might just... I, I make him have a fucking a, hero. A Bruce Lee fucking poster on my wall. One of those fluorescent ones that you put it you did. Light. You probably had a strobe light. I, maybe I did. <laughs> All right. Fog. <laughs> Go ahead. Like Cisco and Ebert over there. I've never heard two <laughs> grown men so angry about pretending. <laughs> In movies, grown people are paid to pretend. Thank you, Fong. It's a movie. But, you no, know, they're portraying it that it's half 
based on reality, half not. No, you're right. So which, which, which half is real, which isn't? Yeah, I know what you mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where, you that's, know. That's why it's a movie. It's not all a right, documentary. All right, all right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Call Bruce Lee's grandfather. Regardless, all pissed off. you said the movie. And write a fucking documentary and tell the truth, Bobo. <laughs> you know and exactly. you know what? You're not going to be featured in this one. So what the fuck do you think about that? <laughs> what is my idea. What do you got uh, you're acting like a little bitch now. So what's what's next? What's next on the agenda, Mr. So, Mott? Well, uh, my, my point is, what the, what no, the defense, wait, 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 oh, wait, Jesus, well, you fucked up my point. Uh, I'm saying now, biopic. Yeah, yeah. Somebody else this. fucked up your point. The point is, if they're doing this in movies now, they're going to easily do this in biopics, where they're going to change the history of the biopic. But a biopic is supposedly based on a true story, but loosely so. I'm saying you're going to see a lot of these biopics that are going to be so, I mean, you're already seeing it, like I said, with Motley Crue and, and some of these other movies. But now I think you're going to see biopics that are so far from reality, but people are going to say, well, it's a biopic. It's got to be true. Mott, Mott, Cousin Mott, what do you have to say? <laughs> well, I say we I like go movie. on to another topic here, right? Because I think we're done with movies since we're not movie critics we're music critics. Let's let's go on. We were talking about. Uh, I think with the email, Bob, we were talking about um, you know upcoming concerts, uh, arena concerts, and talking about basically how all these uh, bands we, we're we're getting the ones that are getting a little long in the tooth are going to be retiring soon, and we're going to be left with pretty much nobody, virtually nobody left uh, playing big arenas and stuff like that. So maybe we could kind of go on to that a little bit. We'll talk about obviously Slayer's playing Iron Maiden. Couple others we That's a topic we covered before. <laughs> What's that? I just fucking laid the box. I can't. I can't hear you. I said that's a topic. Speak up. Get, come on. Get before. get Lenny's dick out of your mouth. Speak up. Come on. I gotta give you shit, man. Come on. <laughs> like a bong just in the background going, "What the fuck is wrong with these people?" So but arena I mean, arena I rock bands. All right, arena rock. No, here we go. Arena rock band. So uh, we'll let we'll let we'll let Eric here get involved. So Eric, any any arena rock bands you come to see up soon? I, I know we got Maiden coming up. We got Slayer. Uh, I don't know if they're playing up in Seattle. I'm, I'm pretty sure they are. Um, anything you, you're going to go check out anytime soon? Uh, you know, the interesting thing to me was that uh, Slipknot just came out with a new album, and I read a couple hours ago, actually, that their album is going to be number one uh, at the on the next uh, Billboard Top 200, and it is the first rock album mm-hmm. to be number one on the Billboard 200 since the, the Foo Fighters album, which was like two years ago. Wow. So... One of the things that we had talked about prior to uh, prior to the show, going back and forth in email, was what kind of newer bands actually have the power to to mm-hmm. to keep playing in arenas. And I mean, Slipknot's been around for a long time, but I think that's pretty impressive, especially from the style of music that they're selling. They sold over a hundred two. Uh, they sold over a hundred thousand albums. There was the Billboard. Uh, the article that I read said that they had like an equivalent of like one hundred eighteen thousand album sales slash streaming but out of that 118,000 102 of them 102,000 of them were actually album sales not streams but actual sales okay. which is pretty impressive it tells you a lot about where streaming is and that it's still in its infancy today um but the fact that slipknot is able to do that is is pretty impressive it is yeah i, I mean I, okay. go ahead. Is, is, is that on roadrunner is that are they still on roadrunner yeah roadrunner oh wow okay yeah, you know what it is too. Those like the Slipknots. Um, like I was thinking the same thing. The four bands that come to my mind. I mean, once once the Metallicas and Priests and Maidens and, and Scorpions and ACC and G, you know Guns and Roses. Once all those bands are gone, the only four I could think of. I had Slipknot in there as well, but the, only, the other three is I guess you, you know Tool. Um, then the new one, which I'm not a big yeah. fan of, is Ghost. But I mean, there are a lot of people that really like them, and because of their their show itself. Um, they're going to be able, I think, to be doing, you know, they'll be able to do arenas, I think, for, for quite a while. Um, so those three really, t- two uh, Ghost and, and Slipknot, and, you know, and like Corn, but Corn really, I don't even think Corn can really draw for arenas. I mean, even though they're, the thing about Corn and Slipknots is, and they still sell pretty well, but you just don't really, I mean, I, have, I don't know of any new songs by them. You know, I mean, the last, the last songs I know from both of them are really f- from a long time ago. There's just no so yeah I mean I, I I'm kind of I'm at a loss of of what bands are going to take over after that because I really don't think there's any there's going to have to be I think a lot of massive package uh, 
you know, tours where you have a, say, a corn and a slipknot and a so forth, all kind of teaming together to, to be able to even, you know, sniff an arena, I think. Um, what do you guys think, uh, Bob, Lenny? No, I mean, that's, that's what you're seeing now is these festivals. These, uh, and the festivals, like I've, I've said uh, before, it's the same revolving dance. With these, like you say, the tool, you know, Rob Zombie, Slipknot will be the headliner, Corn, and then you'll have the second, gen, you know, second to, or event sevenfold sometimes. And then you have, mm. you know, all the uh, Chevelle underneath that. And the five figure death spot. punch, those kind, yeah. Five figure death punch is another like co headliner and uh, shine down. And, you know, but it's yeah. always the same. And they'll add a new one, they'll throw in a Greta Van Fleet or they'll throw in uh, maybe a Dirty Honey. Uh, uh, is that what they're called, Dirty Honey? Yes. You know, Chris is telling me they're in, they're, they're in the top ten on Billboard. This single, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Is, is a, and they're they're unsigned, the right? I believe they're unsigned too. Yeah, yeah. From what I understand, yeah. Um, you know, there's bands like that that are showing promise. Obviously, uh, I don't know, Fom. You probably keep up more with the newer bands than I do. I I do a little bit, um, I, but I you know it's just one of those things like getting from clubs to the the amp the uh the event centers to this to the to the arenas is really really hard i mean i know i very i, I know very few bands that have been able to to make that transit i can't even think of any that have been able to do it just like without a ton of frankly label help i mean even even the bands that that we love that had you know that that had their their peaks at, even at one point in time they had an organically growing fan base, but they also had a lot of label help. And it seems like mm-hmm. labels, at least, you know, acting as, acting as the, the basically, you know, bankrolling artists' careers, they're taking a lot less risks. They're not investing nearly as much because they're not getting as much back. So you don't, you're not having those, those situations where an artist can be four or five albums in and actually develop. So if you can't be four or five albums in, and actually develop what chance do you have of establishing, you know, your, your growth from the clubs to the arenas, um, slip not to band to be able to do it. And, and you mentioned, you mentioned tool earlier. Um, that's a really unique instance of like a band that is pretty much hit in a cave. And they, when they come out, they, they play big shows and they make a lot of money. I assume they make a lot of money. Um, but Ghost is a band that I had never heard of until I read about uh, Hetfield. Hetfield mentioned Ghost and said they were a breath of fresh air. And I, I can tell you when I was at iTunes, like I read that and I sent it around to a bunch of my friends. Some of them already knew about them, but like that was like it was word of mouth. And I think that a lot of bands kind of are hoping for like the like the Metallica touch, right? Or you know, will, will James talk about me? Will Lars talk about me? Or how do I? How do I get? How do I get noticed? And they're kind of looking for that for that bump. You know, can I get on a can I get on a bigger tour? And I think that labels are trying to figure out uh, that also. And I've, I've, I mean, I've certainly heard about instances of like festivals like Coachella where you know a label will tell the promoter, okay, you want you want this band, okay, we well, can have this band, but you need to put band A, B, and C on the bill as well further yeah. down. Um, well, there's, so there's two uh, very distinct, there's two very distinct markets. There's the United States. And there's anything outside of the United States. And here in the United States, we have a very, we're very ADD. Uh, There are so many bands that are touring outside of the United States. I mean, even like we didn't even mention Lamb of God. Those guys are huge. Mm -hmm. They tour all the time here in the States. Well, in the States they do. But that's like one exception of the rule of all the bands that are touring outside of the United States that aren't touring here. There's two very distinct markets, I think. And so when you talk about arenas, it's the United States is a very tough market for arena bands. You know, sure. you get outside of the United States and these bands are, are touring all the festivals, all the arenas outside of the United States. Sure. No, sure you know, yeah. We were just talking earlier really at dinner about like even Dockin. You know, I think Don Dockin said he's retiring. He can't get a gig in the States. You know, he can't, he can't fill a, a show anymore. You know, well, mm-hmm. we talked about on the last podcast bands like Manowar and and now Wasp and a lot of these bands they won't even play the states anymore. Mm-hmm. They'll just play Europe because you know they're playing stadiums out there, right? Uh, you know why? Or well, Wasp maybe not stadiums, but at least the Manowar is still huge out there. You know why come to the U.S. and play clubs? And you know bands like Dokken, I know they could go to uh, Japan and and elsewhere, 
and, and uh, you know, sell out big uh, venues. You know, it, it is much tougher market here. Than Mastodon? The yeah, they do, they, they're doing really well here in the States, too, though. A lot of those bands are, because they're doing all the festivals with all these other bands, yeah. and they're getting up. Uh, and, you know, the thing about Tool, even though they, they're making all this hype, that this is their first album, and how many years or whatever, they had been still playing. Not, I mean, uh, I saw them at the um, uh, the Sacramento uh, big festival. What, what do they call that one? After show. Uh, After well, show. What about a band? What about a band like Romstein? Are they even allowed in the United oh, States? Oh yeah, they, they, they'll come and they'll still tour. They'll yeah, tour that's... for big arenas. I mean, but outside of the United States, they're stadium. amazing. They're yeah. huge. Stadium. Sorry, Go I saw, I got to tell you, this. I saw Romstein, uh, Romstein in like two thousand two at the San Jose uh, Arena, whatever the arena is called now, the Shark Tank, they played with two bands before them, then it was Romstein, then it was Slipknot and System of a Down. And I'd never seen them before. I, and uh, they came up and they did their show with their marching. And my, uh, my girlfriend at the time was Jewish, and we were just kind of watching going, holy crap. <laughs> and I was never really into Romstein's music, but I just remember watching this. I'm like, I don't even know what I'm watching. And then at the very end, uh, as everybody's applauding, Whoever I don't know who it was from Romstein hops on the mic and says, "Thank you, San Jose. We love you. Stay tuned for <laughs> Slipknot and System of the Down." And it just like <laughs> it just ruins the whole mystique of like them being like this dangerous <laughs> industrial band. <laughs> it sounds like uh, the guy from uh, uh, Scorpion. Scorpion. Thank you, Rocket. <laughs> no, but yeah. Bo- and Bob, you made a good point actually about the festivals because. I think that's that's also going to, I think, hurt these arena bands, you know, these bands from, from playing arenas and going on tours. Like a great example, like, you know, you guys were just talking about System of a Down, right? I mean, yeah, they haven't released music in forever, but when they still play, if they play an arena individually, I mean, they they could sell that thing out, no problem, but they're residing to just doing the, the festivals. And like you said, I think it's just, it's it's more lucrative and just more or less of a hassle to just go ahead and get that big, huge check to play a couple of festivals here in the States now, since we finally have a whole bunch of them. I just do a few of those a year, and that's it. I mean, that's all you need to do. You're making enough money. You don't have to go on tour. I think the bottom line is just nobody wants to tour. I mean, I don't blame you. Know? The old school mentality was you go on tour every night, every other night. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, you do these big festivals. You fly in and fly out. Do a festival it, every yeah. week or every other week in the summer, and it's all basically the same revolving lineups, just named at a different festival. You know, mm-hmm. the Mayhem or the whatever the hell they're calling all these festivals now. And it's the same same guy that Steve Steve what's his name Steve Weimer, the same promoter who does all these different festivals. Mm-hmm. Who started with the Warped and the, the Mayhem, and he does all the ones in North Carolina, Kentucky. Florida, it's all the same thing. Bands fly in and out, do the festivals, and yeah, why why need to play every other day at an arena where you could play, you know, once a week or once every other week at a festival and get paid more money? Well, here I can break it down even a, even at the smallest level uh, with my band Snoo. We cannot even get a gig. Yeah, here's here's a, a cheap plug. <laughs> we can't even get a gig in Southern California. We can't even get a gig, but yet we can travel to Europe or the UK and play festivals. Yeah, it's just just the strangest yeah. business, you know. It's very it's very weird. Yeah, well, they still do the pay to play here. Yeah, they still do. Yeah, that, that's yeah. why we never play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, why don't we wind it down, Matt? Sure. <laughs> all right, guys, it's been fun, and thank you, uh, all you guys, for joining us. And now uh, we will speak to you guys soon. Thank you for listening to the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast. Subscribe and listen to all episodes by going to our pages on iTunes, Spreaker, YouTube, Spotify, and more. You can listen to all other episodes and access up-to-date information and news on the Shockwave Skull Sessions podcast by going to our website at www.shockwaveskullsessions.com. Email all comments, questions, and suggestions to shockwaveskullsessions at gmail.com.